The Earliest Civilizations, Ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. Most early civilizations developed along rivers where fresh water and rich soil were available. This was especially true in the area known as Mesopotamia, which is the region between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the Middle East. It is sometimes referred to as the Fertile Crescent because the land there is very rich and good for farming. Oddly, there is very little rainfall in the Fertile Crescent, so farmers had to rely on irrigation and the annual flooding of the rivers to keep their crops watered. This map shows the area that is commonly referred to as Mesopotamia. It's also referred to as the Cradle of Civilization, the area where civilization and culture first started. Mesopotamia was not one single country, but rather a loose group of city-states, independent cities that have political and economic control of the surrounding area. They did have certain cultural elements in common. The first Mesopotamian civilization was Sumer. It emerged around 3000 BC. The cities in ancient Sumer were surrounded by walls and were made of sun dry. This map shows the area controlled by the Sumerians and includes their major cities such as Ur and Uruk. Each Sumerian city-state included a ziggurat, a stepped tower at the center of the city. A ziggurat is a temple and the center of city government. Sumerian city-states were all theocracies, which means they were ruled by the gods and divine authority. Sumerian cities were ruled by priest kings. Around 2340 BC, a group called the Akkadians from the north of Sumer invaded. The Akkadians were ruled by a man named Sargon. He created the world's first empire, or a large area and group of people all under the same leader. The Akkadian Empire ruled much of Mesopotamia until its collapse in 2100 BC. This map shows the area under the Akkadian Empire during the reign of Sargon I. As you can see, it is much larger than the area controlled by the Sumerians. Eventually, the Akkadian Empire collapsed, and it was replaced by one led by the city of Babylon. A man named Hammurabi was the leader of the city-state of Babylon, who conquered most of Mesopotamia in 1792 BC and created what is known as the Babylonian Empire. Unfortunately, the Babylonian Empire fell apart shortly after the death of Hammurabi in 1750 BC. Hammurabi's major contribution to history is what's known as the Code of Hammurabi, a law code he created based on strict laws and harsh punishments. It is best known for its principle of retaliation, usually referred to as an eye for an eye, but it also gave consumer protections against unfair business practices and dealt a lot with family and marriage laws. The Code of Hammurabi was written on massive stone pillars that were placed in the center of every town. In this way, the laws were made public. Everyone knew what the laws were and how they applied to the people. Mesopotamia, like many ancient civilizations, was polytheistic, meaning having many gods. Mesopotamians believed there were lots and lots of gods and goddesses, and each city-state had a specific god it worshipped above all others. The ancient Sumerians were the first group to develop writing. Their writing system was called cuneiform, which means wedge-shaped. It refers to the shape of the reed stylus that they used to create their writing. They would use the reed stylus in a wet clay tablet, mostly for keeping records. Slide like because I screwed it up. What's up? Oh, okay, cool. Um, you're sure you don't have anything else? Like any cards? <laughs> no, I think we're good on the cards. Um, I mean, if you wanted to grade the stuff that's in the turn in tray, yeah, that works good. Uh, just some menus. So, bye. The Nile River is the longest river in the world. Unusually, it flows from south to north. The Nile Delta in the north is called Lower Egypt, while the southern part of the river is called Upper Egypt. Most of Egypt's important cities developed in the rich Delta region. The Nile flooded regularly every year and was very predictable. 
The Nile is one of the few major rivers in the world that flows from south to north. Upper Egypt refers to the southern part of the river, while Lower Egypt refers to the Delta region. In the Delta, the Nile divides into two major branches and several smaller ones. The area of the Delta was the most fertile land available in ancient Egypt, and most of Egypt's major cities were located in the Delta. The Nile is surrounded on both sides by the Sahara Desert. To the south, the river turns into a series of whitewater rapids, called cataracts. To the north, the Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea. These natural barriers protected Egypt from invasion. Like Mesopotamia, Egypt was polytheistic, having many gods. Gods and goddesses of the river and the sky were very important in ancient Egypt, and the ruler of Egypt, the pharaoh, was seen as divine, meaning related to the gods. Two of the most important Egyptian gods were Osiris and Isis, a husband and wife and brother and sister pair who were closely connected to the Egyptian ideas of life, death, and the afterlife. Osiris was a god of earth and vegetation and the cycle of death and rebirth in the annual flooding of the Nile. His wife slash sister, Isis, was credited with developing the process for mummification that Egyptians used to preserve their dead. So something like who was Ferdinand Magellan, Portuguese explorer, I'd take off like one point for right? Yeah, lose, lose a point for that, yeah, because it's not complete. I mean, yeah, he, he is a Portuguese explorer, but what was he exploring? You know, what did he do? Why, why do we remember his name? And then I'm just going to correct it on here. Yeah. I mean, I barely get this stuff back because I file it. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I, I show them that if there's something that was like... So if I do correct something, just like one word? Yeah. If. Yeah, you don't, don't feel like you need to like write out a... To aid him in governing Egypt, the pharaoh used a bureaucracy an administrative organization that helped him govern. He was also aided by a vizier, the pharaoh's chief advisor and the head of the bureaucracy. Ancient Egyptians placed a great deal of importance on the afterlife. They built massive pyramids or tomb complexes for the pharaoh to spend the afterlife in. A dead pharaoh's body was preserved in a process called mummification, which dried the body out and removed all the vital organs and placed them in special jars to preserve them. The body would then be wrapped in special linen to protect it. The Great Pyramid at Giza, here flanked by smaller pyramids from Pharaoh Khufu's wives, is one of the most well-known human monuments in the entire world. The Middle Kingdom lasted from about 2050 BC to 1652 BC. It is usually seen as the golden age in culture. During this time, Egypt expanded into nearby Nubia. Pharaohs during the Middle Kingdom were seen as shepherds of the people who protected the commoners and made public works to benefit them. The Middle Kingdom ended in 1652 BC when a group known as the Hyksos invaded Egypt. The Hyksos used bronze weapons and horse-drawn chariots and easily defeated the, the Egyptians who were still using stone tools and weapons. Take a tumble to this evening, this afternoon. This is how it usually goes, though. I, there are some slides. So do you like type up a script before you do it? It's or? just I'm reading the PowerPoint and then I kind of improvise things here and there in it oh, okay. to get a little more detail once in a while. There was also Akhenaten. This pharaoh closed all the temples except for those to the god Aten. He was almost lost to history because the pharaohs who followed him had his name and image wiped out across Egypt, removing them from documents, buildings, and statues. Following Akhenaten was a young pharaoh named Tutankhamun. He reopened all the temples and died very young. Despite the fact that he was a relatively minor pharaoh, King Tut is actually one of the most well-known of Egypt's kings, mostly because of the discovery of his untouched tomb in the Valley of the Kings by an English archaeologist named Howard Carter in 1922. Tut's tomb offered historians and archaeologists a fascinating look into Egyptian life during the New Kingdom. 
Another important New Kingdom pharaoh was Ramses II. He ruled from 1279 BC to 1213 BC and expanded Egypt's borders into Palestine. According to tradition, Ramses II is the pharaoh in the book of Exodus who battles against Moses for the fate of the Hebrew people. Egyptian society was very stable and shaped like a pyramid. At the top was the pharaoh. Below him were an upper class of nobles and priests who ran the government and religion. Below them was a middle class of merchants, artisans, and scribes, people who wrote things down for a living. The largest part of the population at the bottom were farmers who worked the land. The Egyptians developed their own writing system called hieroglyphics. The word hieroglyphics means priest carvings. They are pictograms, or pictures that represent sounds and ideas. Hieroglyphics are very difficult to write, and so Egyptians developed something called hieratic script, a simplified version of the hieroglyphics used for business transactions and everyday writing. Hieroglyphics are pictures or pictograms that represent ideas, objects, and specific sounds. They are difficult to create and very time consuming. Hieratic script, on the other hand, is much simpler and it can be written much more quickly. It was used by scribes for record keeping and messages. It was usually written on reed papyrus, an early form of paper developed by ancient Egyptians. Ancient Egyptians also created the 365 day calendar. Their art was very stylized and not exactly realistic. As you can see in this image, Egyptian figures are usually bent to impossible poses, with hips and shoulders bent at different angles and the head always shown in profile. Twit. Even after the development of systematic agriculture, not everyone switched to farming. Some people became pastoral nomads, people who domesticated animals and then followed those herds around. One important group of pastoral nomads were the Indo-Europeans, a nomadic group from somewhere in South. Pastoral nomads are people like shepherds and goat herds who follow a herd of domesticated animals around for food and resources. Many people in the Middle East and across the world are still pastoral nomads even today. I started talking about, oh, there's, like he was saying that Atlantis is real, but it didn't sink where people thought it sank in the Atlantic Ocean. I thought it's, oh, I just thought it was in the Southern Ocean. <laughs> 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 so restrained. I was like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Mm. Bravo, sir. Bravo. <laughs> The Hittites used iron weapons to defeat their enemies. They controlled a sizable empire in Palestine to the north of Egypt's territory along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Their empire was not very long lived though, as they were defeated by other civilizations known as the Sea Peoples. The Phoenicians were a group that lived along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in Palestine in the 1200s BC. Unlike many of the other powers that we've looked at, the Phoenicians did not focus on a military, but rather on trade with other people, traveling as far as Great Britain and Northern Europe and along the coast of Africa. The Phoenicians spoke a Semitic language and created a simplified written language of 22 characters called an alphabet. The Phoenician military was not powerful, but as you can see from this map, they built a massive trade empire with routes running all throughout the Mediterranean Sea. One of Phoenicia's most important contributions to Western civilization was their alphabet, named for the first two characters in it, Aleph and Beth. The Phoenician alphabet is the basis for the Greek alphabet, the Latin alphabet, and our own modern English alphabet. The simple set of characters representing specific sounds was easy to use and much faster to write than Egyptian hieroglyphics 
or even heretic script. Another Semitic speaking people to the south of the Phoenicians were the Hebrews. The Hebrews were unique in that they developed a monotheistic religion, a religion that has only one god, called Judaism. Between 1200 BC and 1000 BC, they established a small kingdom in Palestine called Israel, with the capital city of Jerusalem. Their greatest king was a man named Solomon, who built a temple to the Jewish god named Yahweh in Jerusalem. As you can see from this map, Israel was not a large kingdom, or a particularly powerful one, but its importance in the history of the Western world cannot be understated. Its monotheistic religion influenced the direction that religion and culture would move in for thousands of years to come. After the death of King Solomon, Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Israel was overrun by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Judah lasted until the Chaldeans destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. To the left is a map showing the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. To the right, a picture of King Solomon, who was fabled for his wisdom. There are numerous stories in the Torah, the Jewish holy book, of Solomon solving problems in clever ways. One of the best known examples was when two women came to him to settle a dispute over who had the rights to a baby. Since neither woman could agree, Solomon ordered the baby to be cut in half, at which point one of the women, the child's real mother, decided to let the other woman have the baby. Solomon awarded her the baby instead, saying that only the child's true mother would care enough to give it away rather than see it hurt. He was also known for building the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. The religion of the Hebrew people is called Judaism. It is monotheistic, having only one God, whose name was Yahweh, which means I am. Their holy book is called the Torah. Hebrews saw themselves as Yahweh's chosen people. Their main beliefs, such as the Ten Commandments, served as the foundation for much of modern ethics. Judaism has its origins in a man named Abraham who lived in ancient Sumer. The religions of Christianity and Islam also trace their origins back to Abraham, and thus all three religions are referred to as Abrahamic. The Assyrians were a Semitic-speaking people in northern Mesopotamia who used iron weapons and built an empire around 700 BC. They had very efficient communication systems and a bureaucracy. The capital city of the Assyrian Empire was Nineveh, and their best-known ruler was a man named Ashurbanipal, who built a massive library in the city of Nineveh. The Assyrian Empire fell in 612 BC to the combined efforts of the Chaldeans and the Medes. As you can see from this map, the Assyrian Empire was quite large, including much of present-day Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Egypt. Ashurbanipal was a powerful but ruthless king who was known for torturing his enemies and doing terrible things to them. The Assyrians were replaced by the Chaldeans. They established a new empire out of the city of Babylon and are sometimes known as the Neo-Babylonians. Their best known king was a man named Nebuchadnezzar. The Chaldeans were themselves conquered by the Persians in 539 BC. As you can see from this map, the Neo-Babylonian Empire was nowhere near as large as the Assyrian Empire. The Persians were an Indo-European people in southwestern Iran. One of their best known rulers was a man named Cyrus, who ruled from 559 BC to 530 BC. He conquered the Chaldeans in 539 BC, and was known for showing mercy to the people he conquered and allowing them to keep their religion and local government as long as they paid him taxes. This map shows the growth of the Persian Empire under Cyrus, his son Cambyses, and his grandson Darius. Under Darius, the Persian Empire would become one of the largest and most powerful empires in world history, including Egypt, the Middle East, Turkey, and a large part of what is now Iran and Iraq. 
Cyrus the Great was a well-respected and merciful king. He allowed the people he conquered to keep their culture, local government, and religion. As long as the conquered people paid taxes to Cyrus and did not rebel, he basically let them alone. But if a conquered people tried to rebel, Cyrus would crush the rebellion swiftly and harshly. Like, a reminding word doesn't actually share a sound. Like, doesn't share a sound at all. Am I, am I getting on their case about that? Or? Um, Darius divided his empire into satrapies, or provinces. Each province was governed by an individual called a satrap, or a protector of the kingdom, who collected taxes and administered the law. Darius also built a system of roads across his empire so he could send messages and his army anywhere he wanted to very quickly. The monarchy, the king or queen, was strong in Persia, though the empire did eventually decline when the monarch raised taxes too high and people became disloyal. The Persians practiced a religion called Zoroastrianism. It was based on the teachings of a man named Zoroaster, or Zarathustra, who was born around 660 BC. Zoroaster wrote his teachings down in a book called the Zendavesta. Like Judaism, Zoroastrianism was a monotheistic religion with a god of light and order called Hura Mazda fighting an eternal battle against a demon of darkness and chaos called Ahriman. Here we have a picture of Zoroaster in the top left corner. To the right, we have Ahura Mazda, the Zoroastrian god of light and order. And in the bottom left, we have Ahura Mazda grappling with the demon of darkness and chaos, Ahriman. 